And good morning. Welcome to another installment of Risk Unfiltered, uh, where we talk about all things risk management. I am pleased, privileged, and honored to have a colleague, friend, um, in one, Dr. Karen Hardy. Welcome, and thanks for taking the time to chat with us. Always a pleasure to talk to you, Ken, to see what's going on in your part of the world. Yes, yes, and again, um, and so what I'll do is, um, I'm not going to introduce you. I'm going to ask you to tell the folks who you are, what you're currently working on. From whence I came, yeah. yeah. Uh, listen, you know this, Ken, but I've been in the uh, enterprise risk management, risk management area for about 18 years now, uh, primarily in the public sector, but now I spend a lot of my time advising think tanks about um, uh, varying uh, organizational challenges and bringing my risk management lens to those type of studies, which I'm really enjoying and give me a deeper uh, insights about how organizations run within this crazy and complex uh, environment in which we have to operate. Yeah. Um, and so what, um, why don't we just jump right into the mix? So um, what I will mention to the folks is that Karen, um, Karen has been to the Caribbean. She spent some time actually in Trinidad for our first conference, and she will be, she doesn't know this yet, but she's finding out now. Our fifth conference so is on July the 20th. Um, Karen will be one of the speakers. So Karen, you need to blog that out. Thank July you, 20th, 2023. Oh, by the way, you guys may know, Karen is a producer as well. Um, Karen, maybe you should mention the fact that you won like five Emmys, I think. Um, yeah, it's four Emmys, and it was for a, a it was for four. um a documentary that really focused on the risk of of PTSD for um, military veterans and how they actually use K nines to help uh, reactivate themselves after war, um, right? As a result of you know the trauma of war, mm -hmm. um, I like this film because it really uh takes an inside look about their daily life and what it takes for them to reacclimate. So it's a risk-based type of documentary and won four Emmy Awards. I'm really proud of it. It could be seen on Amazon Prime. It's uh, the K-9 for Warriors story, um, a, a new leash on life. And it's really a heartfelt documentary and piece of work I'm really proud of. Yeah, and I encourage folks to look at it because I have seen it. So we have in our midst not just a risk practitioner, we have an author, an Emmy Award winner four times, um, and of course a lecturer. So let's 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 jump in. So 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 Karen, you are currently in DC. I'm in Florida as we tape this podcast. And there's a much mm -hmm. ha with respect to the banking industry, um, not just in the US, but its impact globally. So without getting into the weeds of it, uh, mm -hmm. pretty much uh, most of us will know what would have happened. But give us your take on or your sense of what may have gone wrong. And uh, again, we have not gone in and we're not looking at the books of these entities. But from the reports that we would have read, and I've spent a lot of time and I've written some, some emails about it. Um, what's your take on what's going on? And then further to that, what do you see, if any, the impact to the Caribbean region? Well, you know, um, you know, on a world view, you watch what's happening in one country and wonder, is that an emerging risk for our country, right? right. So I think as risk professionals, that's what we do. What's emerging in one country? Could, is that possible? Is that likely to happen where we right. are? And do we have the interest infrastructure and anything in common whereby that's a realistic thing to worry about. In terms of the banking piece, now, I, I know that you have a background in some level yeah. of banking, and I actually worked at Citibank for, for four years in, in the right. consumer banking market, and this is my take on, on the recent event with SVB specific, specifically. Right. Um, First of all, coming from a consumer banking, I think people need to understand the full narrative of what happened. You know, people jump to conclusions. It's in the news, so there's a lot of you know, uh, uh, you know, narratives from the media about it. But this coming from bank, I think people need to know that they're looking for a place to blame, right? And I think 
it's important to understand who all the actors are within this scenario. You not only have the leadership of the bank, you have the external uh, leadership of the you know Federal Reserve Board and those external right. oversight bodies, and then you also have the consumer. You know, so there's right. plenty of blame to go around. In that, first of all, let's talk about um, the bank itself, um, just the business model of the bank. Um, be invested in a very risky sector, which is technology. There will be fluctuations, right? And just in the nature of banking, interest rate risk is real. Um, you right. have to, you know, you know, be diverse in your investments. So we all know that banks take the bond deposits and they take those portfolios of those deposits and they reinvest it in the market. This particular bank invested strictly, specifically in technology. So the risk is there in terms of, yeah. you know, not spreading things across many baskets. Right. Right? Don't put your eggs in baskets. So the risk of that type of, yeah, of what happened but, but, was very, very high. Right. So so the Wall Street Journal yesterday had an article, and this is now right into your and my space in, with respect to uh, enterprise risk management and maybe operational risk management as, as a subset of that where the Wall Street Journal said, this was primarily, and I'm paraphrasing here, actually I sent an email out this morning uh, with that, that um, these institutions need to focus as much on non-financial risks as they do on financial risks. And that, that literally hit home for me because I, I know of institutions, financial institutions, that says, okay, once our books are in order, we're good. But there are so many external risks or non-financial risks that can impact an organization and not enough focus um, is being placed on that. And, I, and personally, as a risk practitioner, I have found that to be the case. So, so let's, let's dive into the, the space of enterprise risk management as a non-financial risk um, mitigating technique to what's going on. So how do we then hate um, and 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 we're not cast cast casting you know, uh, cast, you know, uh, casting a wide net here because some institutions are probably better at it than others. But if if hindsight is twenty twenty, all of the major banks have been found wanting for various number of reasons: failure, Citibank failure for effective risk management, four hundred million, a couple uh, a year or so ago. Then we have now F FSB. What what um what are we missing? Uh, so if we sit back. If you are asked to go into these institutions, let's forget their ledgers and their balance sheets for a second. What, what would Karen Adi as a risk practitioner for 18 years or so will focus on? And again, we are not soliciting any advice. This is us as risk practitioners having a conversation. What, oh, no. what, what would you do? What, 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 yeah, and, and, what and would you do? This conversation is high in sight, which is the problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Exactly. We're, having, we're, not, exactly. we're having another hindsight question. There's this a whole lot of things we can look at, uh, Ken. First of all, we look at account internal accountability within the organization. Okay. Um, the commitment of of the leadership in terms of oversight. Um, employing the right leadership, like not having the ch chief risk officer who's you know responsible for um, having that role within within the organization. But what I would, what, one thing that bothers me is the model, the business model itself, which is not, that has nothing to do with the market. You can look at any organization's yeah. model and see yeah. where the where the vulnerabilities and weaknesses are. If you start from that, then you automatically will see there's some inherent risk in the model that we decide to take on. And I really feel strongly uh, about that. Um, again, right. if you focus on one industry, it's not always going to be an up industry. There's going to be some down periods, and then right. there's going to be some very extreme instances, right? So the first thing mm -hmm. is to have that, to go in and have that conversation about the structure and the accountability within that organization. And then the other thing that gets, because it's, I don't think it's one answer because there's more than one actor right. involved here. Right, You have right. external bodies. I don't know what the bank examiners looked at when it was time to look at that organization. Maybe the bank mm -hmm. examiners are too um, thinly focused on the financial side. Maybe they also right. need to look at the non-financial um, issues or factors within. Yes. 
running an organization that the, yeah. bank, the external people that come in, they have the opportunity, I think, to be more flexible than the bank itself. Like maybe we should look at more of the non-financial non factors. Yeah. Okay, yeah. for the examiners. Yeah. You know, and then there's the idea about there's some things that just are inherently risky on the consumer. They need to have more risk intelligence. When you go into a bank, especially in the U.S., there's a big FDIC sticker on the bank door. Um, yeah. And when you sign and open up your accounts, there's a statement that says, hey, you're insured to this amount. And a lot of those yeah. uh, account holders have more than ex exceeded the amount of the insurable amount. Um, right. that they were guaranteed as a result of being a customer. So there's plenty of there's a plenty of things to look at, but in terms right. of your question for the for the organization itself, it, it may be um uh I, I would say it could be a symptom of something a lot more deeper within the organization. I mean in terms of uh the ability to be upfront and honest about how they operate the Great. And, and to that point, um, staying with the Wall Street Journal article, they also said, and I totally agree with this because especially if we now take it and move what's happening now and put it as an emerging risk to the Caribbean um, institutions, one of the, the failures identified, well, I shouldn't say failures, one observation made by the Wall Street Journal is that the composition of the boards of many of these institutions lack financial, um, sorry, risk management expertise or intelligence. And so they, obviously there are a bunch of accountants and lawyers uh, construct of the board. And, and, and I, could, I could suggest to you without fear of contradiction, bringing it home to the Caribbean that compositions of boards lack folks with risk management or risk intelligence. And I'm not just focusing, yeah. obviously I'm not speaking to financial risk because that's where the accountants and they bring to bear. So what are your thoughts on that? Have you seen that in your, in your um, well, movement? You, you, yeah. you can find, yeah, you, I've seen that in public sector and government yeah, agencies. Yeah, yeah. Like, a lot of times we have uh, political appointees that come in. Not, they don't necessarily have um, any type of uh, risk intelligence sometimes, mm -hmm. right? Or risk awareness about how, especially right. how it works within the context of the industry that you're working in, like public sector agencies. So it's this right. not about banks, but um, indeed when those new leaders come in, they have to have, they have to be trained on the awareness and the importance of having or integrated risk management within the organization. Because when you don't, you know, who's, who's minding the store? Who's checking right. it and challenging yeah. it? leadership and pushing back which is what the article said because they weren't pushing back notwithstanding uh silicon valley bank to your point didn't have a chief risk officer for about eight months so if if you are if the board a public or private entity but let's let's stay with the public enterprise uh, for a second and and um and a risk manager chief risk officer is sharing data with you and you aren't knowledgeable or you 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 don't have that level of knowledge to fully appreciate what they're sharing with you how then are decisions being made so having said that do you then think and yeah we're going to thread this needle a little bit that um that coming out of this uh this brouhaha this 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 uh crisis of of some folks are calling it uh i don't know regulatory failure or uh, management failure, but risk management failure, um, that board ed education or edification around the risk management space needs to be enhanced. Would would so, that be a recommendation from Karen Adi? Yes, it would be a recommendation because I don't think education hurts. I don't think right. having more information about how things work, especially in the risk management realm, would be um, something that's mm -hmm. not... Uh, you know, beneficial to an organization. But the thing is, again, uh, even if you have a risk chief risk officer, right? Um, the, you know, the buck stops here type of thing. Leadership yeah. has to decide or not decide whether to take the advice or insights of the CRO right. anyway <laughs> into account. And then where is the CRO position within the organization? Does it have a straight line of authority where they can't influence decision-making. That's where we, we are. And they need to understand that, you know, 
get over the territorial stuff and then have yeah. that key role engaged within uh, in the board. Um, they have to have that space in order to to operate and understand that you want someone who pushes back. Um, that's a positive yeah. thing. Um, maybe they had their own ideas of the value of the chief risk officer's input. Maybe they saw it from this insurable. I don't know. We don't know, right? right. Um, and that's something to to think about. Do the leaders value risk management information as an asset, as something, as a plus up for the yeah. organization, or just something else to do? Yeah, and and so that's a nice segue into this other topic. What, what what do you see as the future of what we do? So if we think of um um, and and this is one of my favorite uh, go to topics, the conversation around um, the role of behavioral science in risk management, the role of AI in risk management going forward, where we have. Uh, a, a number of institutions, Fortune 100 companies, hiring behavioral scientists and anthropologists now to help them manage the people risk element. So, so where does what does Karen Hardy see as the future of, of of our bread and butter, our practice of risk management? Where do you see that going? What needs to happen that may not be happening now, from your perspective? I think from what I've been hearing is that having the, the chief risk officer in a solid position within an organization, not to be the one, it, it goes back to the old tune, not to be the one entirely responsible for managing all the risk, but a strong presence within the organization to help influence decisions where risk is, is, is can have an impact. I, I understand the behavioral part too, because, right. you know, people manage risk based on the way they behave and how they perceive it, right? Right. Um, you don't necessarily have to be a behavioral scientist to do risk management. Okay? Right, right. Um, I, I don't think that's what people are thinking. I just think that people are starting to understand that the human factor in an organization, especially in the leadership suite, plays a key role. It's critical. And people yeah. have certain, their own biases, perspectives of what risk is or what could be a possible uh uh, tragic risk or may not be. People have different perspectives right. on what, what, what it is, right? Some people have a very risk averse and others are not. You can have a mixed group of personalities within a setting and depending on who has the influence and the authority, yeah. uh, that can, I mean, we can really go on down to the nth degree here. Um, yeah, yeah, we are. Those and, little and, things, yeah. yeah. But it makes, it, 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 that can contribute to, to, the risk profiling of, of any institution and 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 I, I lit I intentionally brought up the behavioral aspect because um and again bringing it back to the Caribbean um I, I read um something about a week ago where and actually it was in the Economist I think up here that says female leaders make better decision makers around risk than male leaders because they don't have uh, some of those, I don't know, uh, my words, high testosterone levels, uh, and and um, uh -huh. so so. What are your thoughts around that? Being a female leader yourself, I saw that too. Does I does think, gender I, I does, we does gender thing. does gender matter? That's a whole different conversation, Ken, and you know. But it, we talking, we, I told you we go we go <laughs> off script of time. So does gender from perspective wise, perspective wise, does that does that help influence? Decision making. I not you know based on my limited understanding and you know uh, review of the literature on that, I would say yeah. it's worth noting that I think gender may have an influence on how successful mm. organizations are run, right, right, or how they perform, and that's I, I think that's a worthy area to to look at. Okay, right. uh, I don't know what the gender mix was within this particular, you know, within the bank. Interesting, so, right, I'm, I'm right, aware, right. I'm not aware if that e is even an issue. Don't know. Right. Um, but um, when we, I mean, now you're going to do diversity and all that other stuff. Yeah. In terms of return on investment by having, uh, you know, a diverse group of thinking within the organization and women may manage differently than men. I've seen studies about that, but you know, I don't have enough information right now to say, yep, yeah, that's definitely mm. the problem with a lot of organizations. 
Well, no, so I, I agree with that. So one of the, um, so when, when I'm asked, okay, if you're, if you're brought into an entity to look at or say design and develop and implement an, an enterprise risk management, where do you start? And to your earlier point about leadership, I say I start with the people because they are the decision makers and in the people are the executives and, and the leaders and, and the greatest risk. Uh, and this is Ken Axel, having done this for a while like you, the greatest risk I oftentimes say to any institution, it's not as technology, it's, it's the people. Because they're the ones making oh, the decision. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And so how so how then, how then, uh, which is sort of like going back to my, my question about gender, how then do we help mitigate that people risk in organization? Education is one, or risk education is, is one, which I think um for the most part. Uh, as as we as we speak to the Caribbean um, institutions, I, I think there's a severe lack of risk educated leaders, um, and and that that um, that is being addressed through through um, through Caribbean Risk Management Academy. Oh, by the way, that Karen is also a lecturer in uh, as well. But but how how what else can we do as risk practitioners? Um, <laughs> Uh, to, to push that, to you push know, that agenda. Uh, you know, I, I interviewed the chief risk officer at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas a few years okay. ago, and I asked him that question. And one of the things he brought up, which I thought was interesting, was that he thought that the fact that CROs weren't being effective was because we don't do a good job of communicating our worth within the organization or pushing for that, you know, you know, pushing for that position whereby you can't right. influence. He, he talked about, well, how are we communicating enterprise risk management or risk management within the organization? Are we doing a good job of that, of connecting, you know, you know what the problem mm -hmm. is versus how they perceive that position, right? And I mean, there may be something to that. Like I said before, there's plenty to, to, to pass around in terms of areas that could be strengthened to make this much better. It's not 100%, just one thing must be done and then, right. you know, it happens, right? Uh, it takes a collective group of people to make this work. That's one thing that we are finding, right? Right, Ken, it's just not the CEO, yeah. it's just not the yeah. board, it's just not the president. It's everybody within the organization <laughs> has to play yeah. a role in that. And I think that's I think that's what may be missing. So there's a disconnect somewhere within organizations where either the line of communication in terms of understanding what ERM is, uh, th that may be a problem in terms of, well, what is it? And then how does it make it better? And as risk professionals, we have to be in a position to say, well, here's some evidence of how it makes your organization better. The other thing is that I still think it's important to have the accountability piece. Um, when you have an organization yeah. like a, a, a bank, and it could be any organization, Hey, mm -hmm. the, the first notion that your CRO is gone, that should be a red flag. I mean, yeah. it shouldn't take that long. <laughs> you know, that's a huge place, uh, problem. Yeah. 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 I mean, how do you hold somebody accountable? Yeah. Like, oh, I want to know if your, your chief risk officer leaves and I want to know that they left. I mean, that's a huge mm -hmm. void within the organization. Or is it not? Yeah. To the point yeah. that you backfill mm -hmm. it, you know, it's not backfill immediately as if it was a CEO. Mm -hmm. You immediately do something like that. So, right. you know, there's some concerns about the, the whole thing. Something is not clicking. Um, and again, limited uh, knowledge about the, the bank is hindsight conversation. But I don't think eliminating risk management education is the answer either. Right. Or, or not having it more robust. So, so we, um, to use the terms, that military term that everybody is using now, you know, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous, this old VUCA conversation. Actually, I, I, I pulled a, a, another. Oh, by the way, the theme of the um, of the conference, the first two words is Caribbean polycrises. You'll get more information uh, to that. And it's just the 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 interconnectivity of, of and, and the colliding uh, and merging of all these types of risks from geopolitical to climate to potential um, conflict, um, military conflicts, um, 
all that now uh, having a downstream impact to um, more so now and going forward to the Caribbean institutions. So let's let's take it to your second home in the Caribbean there. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so one of the challenges uh, that I have through through our Caribbean Risk Management Academy is raising the risk intelligence quotient of decision makers. Mm. And as of yesterday, um, I was approached by uh, an institution in Barbados, headquartered in Barbados, but has Caribbean wide exposure to to do some training for their leaders in, in um, enterprise risk management, mm -hmm. to review their existing risk registers and to guide them along that um, COSO or ISO uh, 31,000 mm -hmm. path. That's mm -hmm. great. The question that I oftentimes walk away with after these conversations is why now? So you would know because you have been part of this knocking on door for many many years. <laughs> what, what? Why does it take? And again, I'm I'm part of risk unfiltered to speak to the unfiltered that is pushing the envelope. Why does it take? Um, and you mentioned dinosaurs earlier, so I'm going to piggyback on that. Why does it take an <laughs> extinction an extinction level event? Or what I like to call Newton's law of second second law of motion: an object at rest stays at rest until they get kicked in the butt from some ex Why does it still, after all that has happened, their leaders or institutions still need to be kicked or some massive event have to occur for them to realize, hey, you know, this thing that we're offering is, it, it may not be a panacea, but it, it's the next best thing, right? Bad things will still happen, but we are not selling beef to vegetarians here. Why do you <laughs> think? What? Why do you well, think from your time that it, it's such a hard sell one? And secondly, why does it continue to be a hard sell? Well, I think one is because usually uh, organizations feel that everything's okay. <laughs> I mean, why, why I mean, if it's not broke, why if there's nothing to fix? <laughs> you know, they, they, which, which, they is what think S, they which is what Silicon Valley Bank probably was thinking. Yeah. Of, of course, everything's looking up in technology, you know, it, you know, right. that type of thing, a lot of opportunity is just, that was just really bad situation. But a lot of organizations that I've worked with, um, they, they have that, that initial thought of, well, things are going pretty good now. We haven't had any SVB, you know, incidents right. with us or what have you. Everything's been going well. We've been doing this, doing that. And it's always that right now mindset versus you know, future looking, uh, emerging type of risk. So I ran into that a lot. Um, and my response has been, well, you need to think about what's emerging and those things that simmering you may not know of. And those are the things that catch you by surprise. But so a lot of them are just comfortable in their skin where they are right now because there's no evidence of anything going wrong. So if nothing's going wrong there, everything's going right. So why do I need this, right? Why do I need to add this cost Right, right to our organization it's just another cost for us right another level of effort for us um so that's the that's always to challenge people comfortable uh with that and then you yeah and then for those organizations that like you said you started to get some traction as other uh, interest from other organizations within the caribbean and now they want it and you ask well, why now and the right listening to the answer is very important Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. understanding what that what that response is is very very important because I'll let you know that there's going to be a they they in it for the long game or for a short fix. Um, you have to determine what that is. So what is, does that then fall back to your going back to your interview with the MGM um, head there? Does that then mean that we have to be better? risk management salespeople along with being risk managers as well do we do we own some responsibility there um and i really don't know the answer because what crma and you know this well i mean we have the um we have the uh, uh, enterprise risk management certificate that we're doing through kvil that is gaining real traction because folks are walking away 
I'll give you a good example. There was, in the last court, there was uh, a university lecturer, PhD in economics that did the program. Mm. Now she is an evangelist for ERM. I mean, literally an evangelist mm -hmm. for ERM. So much so that we, um, we, um, uh, I created a module and, and, and she built the content around the role of enterprise risk management in the macro economy. And it was so well received, right? So, she, so she's literally um, a convert. So does it, and so that's one way of reaching decision makers. But if we aren't invited into your home, we, we can't come, obviously. So I know you have your podcast you do and you have, Flip the risk, and and you're also an author or a publisher around the risk management. Do we need to be doing more of that? I mean, what are we not doing as risk practitioners to get the word out? But what more can we do? I don't think there's more we can. I think we need to keep doing. I think we need to keep the consistency up, mm -hmm. right? Um, pushing for our presence, right? Um, demanding that we be in decision-making environments. I think we keep pushing what we already know that we need to do. There's some organizations that will be receptive and you showing success of that. And then there's others that mm. are just not ready for it. You have to move on from those. I wouldn't spend my time right. on those organizations who don't get it. I mean, that's a lot of energy to right. be expending. But focus on the organizations that do get it, okay, that mm. is somewhat on their radar. Those are the best candidates anyway. So um, that would be, I mean, that's what I've done is, is even in working with, with agencies is that you, you don't spend a lot of time with those folks who need a briefcase, but with those who already have one because they're right. on the value of having one. Yeah. So, so it's basically separating at some point in time, uh, the believers from the non-believers, uh, the goat from the sheep. Yeah. I just yeah. think it's very important to invest in those organizations that get because it wears us right. down, as you know, because you and I have spoken about it does wear us down having to continuously, yeah. you know, do yeah, yeah. We're not in the business of trying to sell something to people who don't already know the value of something. I mean, even in a yeah. sales model, you wouldn't do that. You usually right. sell to someone who is already invested to some extent. Um, mm -hmm. in it or some version of it and they already have that um, you know um, exposure to how important it is and I, I believe there's plenty of organizations out there who want it and mm -hmm. they're looking for people like us it's just a matter yeah. of connecting those organizations yeah so uh, before I switch topic what yeah. if what <laughs> if and let's 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 take it to the Caribbean what if there are critical institutions, I mean, literally critical institutions that aren't doing this well, and if they don't do it well, could impact the citizens. And, and the same thing could happen here in, in the U.S. because we had, you know, colonial pipeline. We had um, um, Texas during the winter with, all, you know, all of their, uh, what you may call it, the, the um, electricity uh, blackout, you know. <laughs> to me, that's that's, you know, something negligent around the risk management space or foresight or whatever the case may be. Um, because some of these, some of, some of these disasters could have been avoided. It could have been pretty much uh, predicted or should have known. But I, I guess the question I'm asking you, yeah, we, we need to go after those who are more inclined or who are willing to, to walk this path with us. But what of what about the ones who disavow the value of this and because of that could literally impact the lives of an island or a country? I mean, do we well I mean do we just say the heck yeah? No, I mean if you have organizations that, that have that type of impact, well, you're talking about some yeah. type of policy change needs to happen. Mm. For if okay. an organization has that much impact, okay, yeah. then I mean there has to be a policy change. Okay. And there and therein lies therein lies the final topic of conversation. ERM in the public sector. What do governments need to do 
around ERM that they aren't now doing. And and don't speak to the, the US government necessarily where your subject, but of what you may know, or let me put it, what does, what, what currently obtains in, by way of legislation, laws, regulations in the US that the Caribbean institutions should emulate? Hey, it's, I'm going to go with the risk, the general risk management policy right. that the U.S. did because same situation until you get it into policy whereby a public sector agencies, even in the Caribbean, are mm -hmm. on the hook for doing certain things, even if it's compliance driven, it's the idea of maybe you start there and then you mature it over time. I know it may say sound cliche-ish. But you know, leaders only do what they're required to do. Yeah. No, okay. Right. Right. Everything else is like, well, is the am I, is it mandatory? Oh, it's not. Well, then I'm not going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. In the public sector organizations, right? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's what you're speaking that's about. Why, yeah. yeah. That's why you need to have policy. It may not be all agencies. May, for instance, yeah. in in U.S., only the twenty four uh, agencies. We call them the CFO Act agencies. These are the agencies that were of statutorily required to have chief financial officers. So it's mandated for those 24 agencies to have enterprise risk management. Now, the same thing could take place in the Caribbean. It's not everybody, but if you, right. kind of, uh, if you take and focus on the key agencies, especially of those with those, you know, critical missions. Yeah. Right? If it didn't exist, you know, how would the Caribbean function you know, mm -hmm. I, it's about focusing on those handful of agencies, not not everyone, because once you get that yeah. pinned down, then it's, it's much easier than to build and mature from there. But there has to be some type of public policy um, yeah. that has mandatory requirements for leaders, and then you can tie those mandatory requirements to performance and pay. You know, where it hits people the most, but you have to yeah. incentivize yeah. them to do it. Yeah, and 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 the converse to that is as 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 you were alluding to earlier, is that accountability. So there needs to be consequence as well when they don't do it. Yes, yeah, yes. there must be incentives yes. for when you do it well, and then there's consequences yeah. when you don't do it at all. Yeah. Because you're talking yeah. about public funding, public taxpayers. Yeah. I don't know how the you know what Caribbean works in t in terms of that same thing, structure. same way, same, same thing. way. Yeah. But then, yeah. but then there's accountability. Okay, you have to be accountable. Yeah in public trust for uh, being a good steward of those, you know, of, of the financial implications and not managing risk to key programs within the Caribbean. Yeah. And, and, and from your ears to the prime minister of Barbados and Trinidad and Grenada and Guyana and all, we'll make sure they get copies of this. So, yeah. So Dr. Karen Hardy, I want to thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're awfully busy. And by the way, Karen, um, Karen has her podcast. You can actually log on to Caribbean Risk Management Academy and view all the things that Karen does up to and including the fact that she's, uh, she has, um, she produces, I should say, or um, uh, allows for the production or printing of books around risk management. So she's uh, she's she's doing everything in the risk management space that needs to be done uh, to push the envelope. And I am so um, so much of a follower uh, of what she uh, what she has been doing and how she does it. Um, she has never heard me say that, but she's hearing it now for the first time. And Karen also is the <laughs> Most recent um, fellowship. Where's that thing? I'm not seeing it on your wall of, of the Caribbean Risk Management well, Academy. Have, I, well, you know, my office has more than four, more, more than one wall. Well, yeah, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Yeah. But but you'll see a uh, you'll there. see a picture. You'll see a picture with Karen holding up that um, that uh, award in the in the next issue of Future Proof. So I thank you again, Karen. Any any last parting words to the, no, to, the risk love, for the, to the risk lovers and the risk haters uh, across the Caribbean? <laughs> yeah, lovers and haters, right? A lot of lovers and haters. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, it's kind of, um, it's kind of sad that we have to wait until these big incidents happen in order to get a response. Yeah. That bothers me, actually. I don't want, you know, risk management to become one of those 
you know, stories that happen and then it goes away into the next big thing happening. Yeah. I mean, my goodness, we had yeah. COVID, <laughs> you know, you would think, right? You um, would think, but it, yeah. But what it does is it does show that this is a systemic problem in so many industries, not just right. financial. Right. right. And um, and it does help bring awareness. And every time this happens, we can up our game and it gives more exposure to what we do. That's why I do what I do on a consistent mm -hmm. basis, even though I feel like a voice like you do a voice. Uh, yeah, in the middle of this. Yeah. <laughs> but there's always someone watching is what I've learned. And we have to continue to, to press forward because it still yeah. is fairly structure around risk management. We're talking about yeah. structure. Yeah. It. It's yeah. still fairly new, okay? Right. So we just have to keep pushing for it. I, I'm, I feel very positive about it. And and kudos to you, Ken Ford, for doing the work that you're doing yeah. in the Caribbean. Yeah, and I thank you. And it would not have been possible with your um, your involvement. As Aaron, go forth and multiply the information. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> As I say, and um, we'll chat again pretty, pretty soon.